A uh, couple of things I want to talk about uh, before we get started. Um, one, um, we had a uh, uh, movie, Friday night movie night. We had over 30 people here for uh, Heaven is for Real. It was a fun movie. I cried. I, Lin, Linda's back there. Go ahead. Me too. <laughs> yeah. I did. I've seen that movie before, but <clears throat> anyway, it's an emotional movie. And then uh, this Friday, we're watching God's Not Dead, and uh, that's probably my favorite of the two, but it's got lots of music in it, got great acting in it, and uh, you'll want to be here Friday night for that. Uh, uh, doors open at 6.30, movie starts sharply at 7, and uh, it's a great movie. Uh, also, want to let you know that uh, <clears throat> we're making some changes. Uh, we changed our speakers around today, so our sound's just a little bit different. So if we get feedback or something, we're working through some things there. But uh, Ron tried to use one of these speakers to comb his hair, and uh, it didn't work out well. So if you want to have fun, if you got a magnet, just walk by and just bump, stick it on his forehead. It would be kind of fun. <laughs> Sorry, Ron. <laughs> what did he say? What did you say? Talking about hair, aren't you? Yeah. yeah. Where's the love? Where's the love? And <clears throat> also, things that are going to be changing here is um, our worship. And we're trying to put that together a little bit differently. But Jesse's uh, <clears throat> committed to uh, uh, be a part of that. And Farah and Ron has uh, agreed to do some stuff. <laughs> Ron sitting back there going, I did not. So. <clears throat> We're going to put some of that stuff together, and it's going to be pretty cool. Um, so that's going to be changing, too. So we'll just kind of keep you posted, and we'll, we'll, we'll make it happen as it comes together. Also want to let you know that uh, last Saturday, we're going to show a video later on, but um, last Sunday after church, we went to um, Alpha Farm and six baptisms in this little church. Marie McKenzie, Shelby, CJ, Sierra, and AJ all baptized last Sunday. <laughs> Thank you. I put, uh, this, is, this is how incredible our age is right now. I posted on Facebook six baptisms at the mountain on Sunday and had people from all over the United States just posting back saying, congratulations, great news. A friend of mine from Kenya uh, on the other side of the world is just celebrating with you guys for, for what you did. So it's really cool. And I, I personally have been blessed, and, and I really consider it a blessing and, and uh, just a gift from God that I have been able to step into the baptistry so many times with so many different people. And each time I do, I'm drawn back to that one scripture that we talked about last Sunday, Luke 15, that says there'll be celebration among angels in heaven for one person that comes to the Lord. Is that incredible? That not only are people in California and New York and Pennsylvania and Africa celebrating with the decision that you guys made, but angels in heaven are actually celebrating uh, and over what you did. And that's just an incredible thing. So anyway, on to our, bless our lesson for today. Um, <clears throat> two women came before King Solomon, and they were dragging between them a young man in a three-piece suit. Uh, this young man is a CPA, one of the women says, and he had promised to marry one of my daughters. The other woman says, no, no, wait a minute, wait a minute. He's agreed to marry one of my daughters. So they just haggled with the king for like 10 or 15 minutes. He should marry my daughter, he should marry my daughter, and went back and forth, back and forth. And finally, King Solomon said, enough. I don't want to hear any more about it. Go and bring me my sword. Bring me my biggest sword. And he says, we will divide this CPA, this young man, in half, and each one of you will have one half. Well, one of the ladies said, well, that's fine with me. That'll work out good. I'll get my half of a husband for my daughter, and we'll go on about the, our ways. But the other lady said, no, that's not right. I don't think that that man should pay with his life for the mistake he made. Let that woman have him for her son-in-law. And the king says, so it will be. She will have him for her son-in-law. And she says, wait a minute. I was stopped this. I saved his life. She was willing to kill him, and you're going to give him to her, and he says, yes, she truly is a mother-in-law. <laughs> okay, you guys go out, you try to find a King Solomon joke and see what you come up with. That's the best we could do. <laughs> We're still looking for one. Jeez, thank you. Okay, last week we started, uh, <clears throat> was week two of this new series that we're doing called The King's Family. And two weeks ago we talked about King Saul. He was the first king of the Israelites uh, before that, the Israelites had a system that they called the judges. 
And uh, Samuel was the last judge in that system. And then the Israelites said, uh, they kind of looked at uh, 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 Samuel's uh, children who would have succeeded him in the judgeship, and they said, nah, we, don't, we don't want them. So they said, we want kings, like all the other ki- uh, countries around here have kings over them, so we want a king. Now Samuel was the last judge, and he really didn't want things to change. He thought the judge system worked really well. And, uh, and when they made Saul the king, Saul never really did a very good job of it. He never surrendered his uh, position, his life over to the Lord. So um, he, matter of fact, he edged God out of his leadership. And he took over it himself. Anytime he had a success, he took credit for it. Anytime that he had a failure, he blamed his people for it. But God was completely out of that. But <clears throat> even though his... His leadership was not a great success uh, in the books. His life and his leadership have a lot of lessons that we can learn from. The first one is, is that we need to learn to confess our sins to God. We need to do that. And we need to take responsibility for the mistakes that we make in our life. And then if we confess our sins and we take responsibility for the mistakes that we make, then we should freely accept the grace and forgiveness that God eagerly wants to lavish out on our lives. Then last week we went on to the second king, and that was King David. And we learned in that study that there is a wonderful kingdom that God wants to construct in our lives, and it's a kingdom of purpose and peace. And we looked at the scripture that says, no eye has seen what no ear has heard, and what no human mind has conceived are the things that God has prepared for those who love him. And throughout history, as we've looked at this type of scripture for thousands of years, we thought this, he's talking about heaven, and that heaven is going to be this really neat place that we're going to put, that he's putting together for us. And I believe it is, but I also believe that he's talking about the here and now. That most folks kind of miss that, that God has created this environment for us. And that's what he's describing here. But to receive the blessings that God wants to give us, we have to remember that we need to have an overarching personal characteristic that's strong enough to serve our other characteristics. And also, we need to grow our spirituality, our integrity, our humility, which all enables us to serve others and gives us a personal security and a proper relationship with authority, which is also necessary in the eyes of the Lord. And we talked about that too, how we need to submit to the authority of people on earth. And God has given authority over us on earth to kind of test us into that submission so we can model that further with the uh, Lord. Now there's also a, a third installment <clears throat> in this series, and we're going to do, I think, a total of five of them. But this is, uh, is the king's family, and we're talking today about Solomon. Solomon was king number three. If we look at Solomon, probably most of us, as we think about his life, uh, we're kind of drawn back to 1 Kings 3. And here's what it says in that scripture. It says that Gibeon, the Lord, appeared to Solomon during the night in a dream. And God said, ask for whatever you want me to give you. And Solomon answered, he says, you have shown great kindness to your servant, my father David, the previous king, because he was faithful to you and righteous and upright in your heart. You have continued this great kindness to him and have given him a son, Solomon, to sit on the throne this very day. Now, Lord my God, you have made your servant king in place me pardon me, you have made your servant king in place of my father, David. But I am only a little child, and I do not know how to carry out my duties. Your servant is here among the people you have chosen, a great people, too numerous to count or number. So give your servant, give me, Solomon, a discerning heart to govern your people and distinguish between right and wrong. For who is able to govern this great people of yours? The Lord was pleased that Solomon had asked for this. So God said to him, since you have asked for this and not for a long life or wealth for yourself, nor have you asked for the death of your enemies, but for discernment and administering justice, I will do what you have asked. I will make you, I will give you a wise and discerning heart so that there will never be anyone like you, nor will there ever be. Moreover, I will give you what you have not asked for, 
both wealth and honor, so that in your lifetime you will have no equal among kings. And if you walk in obedience to me and keep my decrees and my commands as David your father did, I will also give you a long life. Then Solomon awoke and he realized that it was a dream. And he returned to Jerusalem, stood before the ark of the Lord's covenant, and sacrificed burnt offerings and fellowship offerings. Then he gave a feast to all of his court. Now, not only did Solomon or did God give Solomon his request, which was to be a very wise person, the wisest person who was, he also gave him riches, he gave him fame, he gave him prosperity, he also gave him a very long life. <clears throat> And if you remember, he did all those things as extras. It wasn't what Solomon had asked for, but because he asked for the right things and he was in the will of God, God even gave him more and lavished more things out on him. Now, wisdom can be a, su a subjective thing um, in our society. I know there was an older preacher who uh, told a story of a young minister who was interviewing for uh, his first pastorate position. And they formed a pulpit committee and, and brought him in to ask him. And they, the chairman of that committee sat down. He says, Sunday, he says, do you know the Bible uh, pretty good? And, the, and the, the young man said, yeah. He says, I, I know the Bible pretty good. And he said, well, uh, which, which part of the Bible do you know the best? And he said, well, I'll be honest with you. He says, mostly in the New Testament. And he says, I, I know that pretty, pretty well. He said, well, what's the, your favorite part, your, the part that you know the best in the New Testament? And the young guy says, well, several different areas that I know well. And he says, well, okay, just uh, tell me the story of the prodigal son. <clears throat> so the young man stood there and stood up, and he said, well, there was a young man, and uh, he was a Pharisee, and his name was Nicodemus, and he went down to Jericho by night, and he fell into a stony ground, and the thorns choked him half to death. The next morning, Solomon and his wife, Gomorrah, came by and carried him down to the ark for Moses to take care of it. But as he was going through the eastern gate into the ark, he caught his hair on a limb and hung there for 40 days and 40 nights and afterwards did hunger. And the ravens came and fed him. The next day, three wise men came by and carried him down to a boat dock and he caught a ship to Nineveh. And when he got there, he found his wife Delilah sitting on a wall. He said to the people that were there, chunk her down, boys, chunk her down. And they said, how many times shall we chunk her down? Seven times 70? And he says, no, 70 times 70. And they chunked her down 490 times. And she burst asunder in their midst, and they picked up 12 boxes of leftovers. And then the resurrection of the wife shall be. And then the committee chairman says, whoa, 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 stop. <laughs> stop here. What are you doing? He says, he turned to his committee members and he says, fellas, I think we got to go ahead and offer him a job. He obviously knows a lot about scripture. So knowledge is a little bit subjective, <laughs> depending upon who's hearing it and who's saying it. Well, Solomon had all that a man could ask for and more. He had the best of everything. He had the best of housing. He had the best of food, the best in education, the best in clothing, the best in military training, the best in training in whatever came up when it came to riding a horse. He had the best horsemen in the country teach him personal private lessons. When it came to self-defense, he had the best fighters, the best military people, military tactics. He had the best generals come and teach him personally. Medical treatment, he had the best, the best home. He had the best of everything in his life laid out to him at his feet. But did it make him happy? <clears throat> well, here's what we know about his life. Just some random type facts. He was the son of King David and Bathsheba. You remember their story and how that all started. He was charged with building this magnificent temple for God, which he did, and he really did a great job with it. He had fame among the nations. In 1 Kings 4, it says that he was wiser than anyone, including Ethan the Ezraite, wiser than Heman, wiser than Kekol, wiser than Derda, the son of Mahol. His fame spread to all the surrounding nations. And he possessed an expertise in almost anything. Anything you ask him, he knew the answer to. Remember, God made him the wisest person in the world. He spoke 3,000 proverbs and songs. His songs numbered 1,005. He spoke about plant life from cedars of Lebanon to the hospice of uh, the, the hospice of uh, the grow of the walls. He also spoke of animals, birds, reptiles, fish, from all nations, people came to listen to Solomon's wisdom, and they were sent by the kingdoms of the world who had heard of his great wisdom. He wrote Proverbs. He wrote uh, many of the 
uh, many of the Proverbs. He wrote Ecclesiastes. He wrote Song of Solomon's. If you haven't read those three books, just read them. Just read them. Don't even think about it. Just go home and read them. Uh, Song of Solomon's is all about man-woman relationships, so it's kind of a PG-13. Uh, a little racy in the Bible there sometimes. But uh, Proverbs and Ecclesiastes are just great books that you don't want to rush through. You want to take your time and enjoy them and read them. He was the richest and wisest king ever. In 1 Kings 10, it says, King Solomon was greater in riches and wisdom than all the other kings of the earth. The kings made silver as common in Jerusalem as stones and cedar as uh, plentiful as sycamore fig trees in the foothills. He had incredible military strength. Solomon accumulated chariots and horses. He had four, uh, 1,400 chariots and 12,000 horses. Taylor, someday. <clears throat> he also had an endless supply of manure, which he kept uh, in the cities, the chariot cities, and also with him in Jerusalem. His life was full of uh, tragedies. It was uh, full of successes. Um, he had 700 wives. He had 300 concubines. Um, full day's job. Uh, says that King Solomon, however, loved many foreign women besides Pharaoh's daughters, Moabites, the Ammonites, the Adamites, uh, the Sidonians, and the Hittites. They were from nations about which the Lord had told the Israelites, you must not intermarry with them because they will surely turn your hearts after their God. Nonetheless, Solomon held fast to them and, and did take them in. And he had that number, 700 wives of royal birth, 300 concubines of his wife, which did lead him astray. As Solomon grew old, his wives turned his heart after <clears throat> other gods, and his heart was not fully devoted to the Lord your God, as the heart of David his father had been. And he figured out at the end of his life, um, he kind of had this chance to look back. And uh, he realized that everything that the world can offer is really vanity. It's just uh, it's a very fleeting thing. And he, he, he explained this best in Ecclesiastes 1-2. It's one of my favorite books. But he just, he's talking about everything of this world. He says, meaningless. It's meaningless, says the teacher. Utterly meaningless. Everything is meaningless. He thought that his own wisdom could make him happy, but in reality, that was just vanity too. Ecclesiastes 1, 16 through 18 says this, I said to myself, look, I have increased in wisdom more than anyone who has ever ruled over Jerusalem before me. I have gained much wisdom and knowledge. Then I applied myself to the understanding of wisdom and also of madness and folly, and I have learned this too, is chasing after the wind. For with much wisdom comes much sorrow. The more knowledge, the more grief. He thought that pleasure would bring him happiness. So he, he turned to that. Ecclesiastes 2, 1 through 2 says, I said to myself, come now, and I will test with pleasure to find out what is good. But that also proved to be meaningless. Mad, uh, laughter <clears throat> is madness. And, that, and what pleasure accomplish? <clears throat> and what does pleasure accomplish? He thought that food and wine would make him happy. Uh, but that too, he found out, was it vanity. He said, I tried cheering myself up with wine and embracing folly. My mind still guided me with wisdom. I wanted to see what was good for people to do under the heavens during the few days of our lives. He also thought he could find contentment and wealth, but he found out that that was in vanity. He said later, he said, whoever loves money never has enough. Whoever loves wealth is never satisfied with their income. This too is meaningless. In essence, what Solomon was saying about his whole life is that I have done it all, and there is only one thing that is consistent or constant and upon which you can depend your entire life. And he says that is just to fear God and keep his commandments. That's it. Everything else is kind of meaningless and peripheral around your life. But if you fear God and keep his commandments, you can find happiness in this world. The wisdom that is from God is more valuable than anything else. Money, things of this world. Proverbs 16.16 16 says, How much better to get wisdom than gold, to get insight rather than silver. The life of Solomon was filled with great accomplishments and great tragedies. 
Solomon's life began with a purpose, but it went astray, and eventually it was destroyed. Jesus said in Mark 8, 36, he said, For what shall it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? And if you just think about our lives today, think about the things that we have in our lives today. Cell phones, microwave ovens, minivans, homes with heating and air conditioning. I mean, I don't think anybody ever has a home anymore that doesn't have air conditioning in it. Home computers, paved roads, satellite TVs, DVR is my personal favorite. Electricity, processed food, laptops, iPods, pornography, bottled vitamins, refrigeration, lawnmowers, running water, indoor plumbing, all of these things that we have. Now Solomon had it all by worldly standards. But we have it all by worldly standards. Do you, do you know that in Haiti... If you're a mother in Haiti and you want to have a child to live to be an adult, you have to have four children because 70% of them will die if you're going to be in Haiti. We have it all by worldly standards right here. Do you know that in port pay the average mother who wakes up when the sun rises and she wakes up, her first thought is, where will I go to find food for my family today? We have it all by worldly standards here. And at some point, that Haitian woman most likely will have to make the decision which one of her children is going to eat today and which one of them will go hungry today. They make those decisions every day. And we have it all by worldly standards. We truly do have it all by worldly standards. In America, the, we are in the top 5% of the economic strata of the world. Now, I don't know what anybody here makes but you are in the top 5% of the world population. If you're making $20,000 a year, or $10,000 a year, or unlimited money, you're in the top percent of the world. Much of the poor in our country have so much food, they're overweight. Did you ever think about that? Much of the poor in our country have so much money that they can buy cigarettes, alcohol, illegal drugs. Much of the poor in our country have more than one vehicle. They have color TVs. They have pets. They have cell phones. Their children are educated. They receive excellent medical care. They vote. This is the poor. And I'm not saying this to, to uh, down, uh, beat down the poor for all the things that they have. I'm just showing the incredible blessings that we have, who have jobs, who have a roof over our head. We're the top 5% of the world population in this room right here. And if the temptation and the failures of Solomon were understandable for him 3,000 years ago, look at us. So I want to ask the question, a discussion question for today, and it's this. It's, are you asking God for the right things in your prayer life? Are you asking God for the right things? And are you letting him know how appreciative you are of the things that you have? So we're going we're gonna to do things just a little bit different today. We're going to ask you for your prayer request if you, if you feel so led to do that. And two things I'm going to start off with is that we need to be incredibly aware of, especially in this country, because we're so powerful. You know the one area that we lead the whole world in? It's not education, it's not medical training, it's not, you know, the one area, the number one, we're fourth in wealth in the country. What? Crime is probably it, but it's military. We spend more in military power than the next four largest countries put together. That's the one area that we do. But in Iraq right now, there are Christians that are being persecuted. They're being slaughtered. There's, there's things that are going on right now in, in Iraq. I can't even tell you what's happening. I've seen it on videos. It'll absolutely turn your stomach. I said to Mike today, I said, did you, did you see this video about it? He said, I don't want to see it. I don't want to see it. I don't want to see it. The things that they're doing to children, women, children, men, young men, on a mass scale, thousands and thousands and thousands of people are being killed. Christianity is almost completely eradicated in Iraq right now. Towns that have had uh, 160 churches, Christian churches, they're all burned to the ground. And the people are living on the top of a mountain, Christians. They have no food, they have no water, they have no diapers. They're just, 
waiting up there for somebody to save them. <clears throat> and uh, us, uh, the United States, and some of our allies have begun to do some things this week. Unfortunately, tens of thousands of people had to die first before it did. So we need to be, as a church, we need to be very prayerful about the persecution of Christians around the world. It's happening in Iraq. It's happening throughout um, uh, Africa. And if you remember your history in Germany, what happened? You know, things happened. People, Jews were persecuted. It was a few of them. You know, we closed their shops down. We ran them out. We stole their house. The Germans did this and this and this. And, and everybody just sat back and went like, well, you know, it's a shame. But, uh, you know, it's not me. But the day will come when it will be us. And evil only exists because good people do nothing. So we got to do something about it. Right now, we can't, uh, I'm not asking anybody to, uh, put on camos and head overseas, but we can pray. And we need to be very prayerful right now for Iraq and the Christian persecution in Iraq and Africa. We also need to be very prayerful about the situation in Israel, with uh, between Israel and Hamas. This is not just a conflict that's on the other side of the world that doesn't affect us. It is critical for our existence here. And for us to call ourselves Christians, we have to do something, but we can pray. Uh, I don't expect uh, massive amounts of money to go over there or anything, but we can pray for those people and we can encourage our government leaders to stand up for what's right in the eyes of God. And sometimes that causes good people to lose their life, but uh, that's just part of it. Since our country has been founded, 1.5 million Americans have died to protect our freedoms. Not all of it's been done on this uh, this uh, land. A lot of it's been done overseas in Europe and South Pacific and in countries nobody even knows about. And I'm afraid it's going to take more Americans to protect our country and do what's right, but we need to do it. So I'm going to ask you this week to commit to pray for Christian persecution in Iraq and in Africa and also for the situation with Hamas and Israel. <clears throat> we also have other things inside of our own doors here to pray about. You know, Ron could have been really seriously hurt. It could have been a very serious accident. Um, and he just got out with a few staples in his head. But uh, we need to pray for a quick recovery for him. I also know of a lady by the name of Shauna that's in the hospital with an unknown infection that's shutting down her internal organs. And uh, she has a husband and three girls. And her body's just shutting down right now. Uh, We've brought in uh, Ebola into our country, and we need to be very prayerful about that as a church. You know, that's what God gave us. That's the tools he gave us to fight these things. It was prayer. You know, he didn't say everybody has to go out and get, grab a gun and travel to a foreign country and give their life or something, but we can pray as Christians. So kind of a crazy thing. But, well, how can we pray for you today? How can we pray for you? Barbie's going to be traveling to Pennsylvania later unless she unless I talk her out of it. And I've been trying pretty hard. <laughs> Let the air out of her tires. Huh? Leave and leave Maddie with me? No. <laughs> no, take your dog. <laughs> but we can pray for Barbie and uh, for safe travel. <laughs> Taylor's going back to school. She, she's got to pray for school. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, pray for the staff at uh, Asbury. What else can we pray for you? Bill. Ashton. Bill Corns, yeah, couldn't make it through church today. He's just in so much pain, his knees. If any of you want to talk to Ron or I or Pat or Jennifer, please see us after church. We'd like to we'd like to commit to pray for you specifically. Uh, Jesse, I added him to my prayer list every morning, eight o'clock. I told him I said every morning, told him to you here different every morning, eight o'clock. I'm praying for you every morning. Um, that's what we're, we're supposed to do as Christian people. So uh, <clears throat> if you have some prayer requests that you need help with or you want us to um, be intentional about, uh, we, we, um, 
Ron and I share stories together because we feel that we're covered under the the um, the covering of ministry here to uh, discuss things that are confidential and private uh, in between. Other than that, uh, whatever is said uh, between us stays just between us. But uh, if you have prayer requests, we'd love to love to pray for you. But let me pray for uh, these ones that we have right now, and then we'll uh, get on to our discussion question. Are you asking God for the right things in your prayer life? That's our question. Well, Heavenly Father, we thank you for uh, giving us this time together. Thank you for this life of Solomon who's so rich. It's so rich in life lessons. This book of Ecclesiastes is one of my favorite books of the Bible that just tells us how to get through life and uh, gives us so much wisdom there. And thank you for uh, giving us that example of one individual who prays this simple prayer, make me wise so I can best serve your people. And you say, yeah, I can do that. I can make you wise and I can provide you with wealth and I can provide you with a long life and I can provide you with security and I can do a lot of wonderful things for you. But because your heart is right first, I'll do these things. Thank you for that, Father. And Father, I, I don't know this lady, Shauna. I don't, <clears throat> I don't know her. I, but uh, my heart breaks for her, especially with three children and a husband that must be at home panicked, wondering about her immune system and internal organs shutting down. Father, I ask for your intervention. I ask for your healing hands to reach out to her in the hospital bed and heal her. Father, I believe that with all my heart, that all things are possible through Christ. I believe everything is possible. So, Lord, I know you can do that. I also ask you, Father, for uh, wisdom <clears throat> for um, Ashton, God, that she uses uh, good judgment, decisions that she makes. I pray that every step of her life honors and glorifies you, Father. I just pray that. I pray that uh, miraculous things will be done in her life and, of course, the life of her sister and her brother. Marvelous things will be done, <clears throat> all glorifying you, Father. I also pray for Barbie as she prepares for a trip with Maddie, that they have a safe trip back to Pennsylvania. God, that you make the roads clear for them, traffic easy for them, especially as they get around that Baltimore area. And God, uh, get her home uh, safely and uh, bring her back. Pray for that too. Also pray for Taylor and James as they prepare to go back to college and all the kids that are here that are getting ready to go back to school this fall. God, I pray for clarity of thought and mind. I pray for favor with them with tests and teachers that they get the best teachers and the best education, the best seat, and they're able to focus on their lessons and that they grow in knowledge. And I also pray, Father, for all of them, high school, junior high school, elementary school, middle school, college, uh, graduate school. I pray that they be a witness to their faith in the school system because our school system, our government is uh, not allowing some of that. So we can live out our Christian faith just by the way we live our lives. So I, I pray for boldness for them. I also pray for Bill <clears throat> as he uh, goes through such a difficult time with his uh, knees and the pain that he has. And uh, God, as he uh, is now an octarian, uh, his body's beginning to, to age. And God, I just pray for mercy from you for him and for Ron and Jennifer as they uh, take care of him and look after him and Shelby also. And Father, we uh, pray specifically for the Christians in Iraq that are uh, being murdered and uh, being persecuted, being round up and uh, <clears throat> given a choice to either uh, turn their back on you or be murdered. And uh, we're hearing that in many cases uh, of great fear, Christians are denouncing you and are turning their back on you and saying, I'll accept Allah as, uh, as my savior. And even in those cases, those people are being killed. So, Father, I pray for um, favor for them. I pray for um, a world community of nations that will come together <clears throat> and um, intervene in your children's um, lives. And Father, we know that we were told through your scripture that there will always be persecution. There will always be poverty. There will always be people being persecuted and starved to death. But Father, this is happening on such a massive scale. It appears that it will take your divine intervention to stop that. So we ask that, Father, in Iraq and in, um, in Africa specifically, and uh, also in China, the persecution that's going on in China. And thank you, Father, for what you're about to do right now. And also we pray for your chosen people in Israel as they defend themselves surrounded by enemies, many of which who have part of their law is to destroy your children. That's their purpose, is to destroy your children. God, we pray for continued favor for Israel 
and uh, this iron curtain of defense that you've given them to ward off so much death and destruction, Father. Thank you for that. And, and God, I also pray for the Hamas and uh, the uh, people that seem to be supporting, the ISIS people that seem to be supporting um, evil in the world. God, I pray for them. I pray that their hearts will be cha trained, changed. And uh, God, again, I know that all things are possible through you. I just pray for witness to them and that uh, evil will be um, eradicated. The scriptures say it'll never happen until your son reappears. So we know what we have to look forward to. But Father, we, we pray for as many as possible to save, not perish or die. Thank you, Father, for that. Thank you for this little church that you've given us and this family of people that Pat and Ron and Jennifer and I love so much. Uh, thank you for that, Father. Lord, we love you. We praise you and we worship you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Ever feel left out? Ever feel like you just don't understand? Or that nobody understands you? You ever feel like nobody cares? Come climb the mountain. It's nothing like you've ever seen. Our philosophy is simple. Love God, love people. The Mountain Community and Christian Learning Center. It's faith, it's family, and it's friends. Stroll in, grab a donut, some coffee, and grab a seat. Enjoy the company of a warm, welcoming family of Christ followers as we encourage, support, and worship together. No Sunday's best here. Simply come as you are. Come as your own Father would have you. On Sundays, 9 a.m. is Happy Hour Fellowship with a message from Pastor Brad Allred or a guest speaker starting at 10. If you're looking for a church family or simply looking for a change, stop by and visit. We'd love to have you.